Today we're going to be doing a bit of an introduction to bonding. This actually refers back to the You Light Up My Life and the Electron Glue activities that we completed in Modules 8 and 9. So first of all, what, what is a chemical bond? A chemical bond is simply an attraction between atoms that holds them together in space. So uh, we have seen the difference between elements and compounds before. So for example, sodium is an element. It sits by itself. Chlorine is an element. It sits by itself. But when I combine those two things to form a compound, NaCl is formed, this is a compound, and what holds them together is this chemical bond. It's an attraction that holds the atoms together in space. So in the electron glue activity, we were introduced to four major types of bond. The first one we looked at was ionic. Now, ionic bonds are made up of metals and nonmetal atoms. And so anytime we see a metal combined with a nonmetal, we know that that is going to be an ionic compound. Uh, ionic compounds tend to dissolve in water. They conduct electricity only when they're dissolved not when they are solids, and that's something we explored in great detail. Um, and they do tend to be brittle solids. Now just to revisit this whole metal, non-metal thing, right, if we take a look back at our periodic table, we remember that there's this staircase over here, and this staircase splits kind of going down and to the right-hand corner. Now, oops, sorry about that. Now, anything that is on the left-hand side of the staircase is considered a metal. Okay, so all the metals are over here on the left hand side. Um, and then anything on the right hand side would be considered a nonmetal. So the metals are on the left hand side, the nonmetals are on the right, and the thing that splits the two is this staircase on the right hand side of the periodic table. Now remember uh, that helium, or hydrogen, I'm sorry, hydrogen up here on the top left hand corner, he's kind of a, an anomaly. He sits by himself, but he's actually considered a non-metal. But everything else over here would be considered a metal. So just revisiting really quickly the ionic bond, when we say it's made up of a metal and a non-metal, that means when I go to the periodic table, I see something from this side over here and something from this side over here. We can apply the same logic to all the other different models. So model two is a covalent network. Well, a covalent network is made up entirely of nonmetal atoms. And so it might be a nonmetal uh, bonded with another nonmetal. And it might even be bonded with another nonmetal, right? And so we see all nonmetal elements here. All nonmetals make up a covalent network. Covalent network molecules or covalent network bonds tend to not dissolve in water. They don't conduct electricity, and they're usually very, very hard solids. The third model we looked at was metallic bonds, and metallic bonds are actually made entirely of metal atoms. So I would see either a metal attached to a metal or just straight up a metal by itself, and I would know that, let's say I had a giant piece of iron, well, it's going to be made up of simply iron attached to iron, so it's all metal atoms. Metals, as we saw in our lab, tend to not dissolve in water. They do conduct electricity very, very well, and they tend to be very bendable solids. The last one is called a molecular covalent bond, and the molecular covalent bond is very much like the uh, network covalent in that it's made up entirely of nonmetal atoms. So again, you'll see nonmetal attached to a nonmetal. Now, these are a little bit different than the network covalent because some of them do dissolve in water, though others do not. Um, again, they don't conduct electricity, but these tend to be liquids or gases or even softer solids, whereas the network covalent was very, very hard solids. So if you noticed, right, there was two different compounds that were called covalent. All right, so over here we had a network covalent. And over here, we had a molecular covalent. Now, there's a distinct difference between these two, and it's pretty obvious in the picture, but it's because molecular covalent is broken down into these things called molecules. All right, So these things are molecules, molecular covalent. 
all right? So the difference, right, is that these are broken up into these smaller little pieces called molecules, whereas my covalent network is actually all hooked together across and up and down, right? They're all connected, whereas the molecules are a little broken up. Atoms that are connected into many identical units are called molecules, and so all of these little units are identical little pieces, okay? Uh, it could be composed of only two atoms. It might be dozens of atoms, but the point is that they're not all connected, but that they exist as smaller units in and of themselves. Um, now, the fact that they're covalent, right? Remember, that means that it's nonmetals connected with nonmetals. So we've seen this flowchart before. This was part of our You Light Up My Life activity. Uh, this is just a different way that we use to organize it. And so we put every everything in here to a certain amount of tests, right? We saw if they dissolved and then if the either the solid or the dissolved liquid conducted electricity. And so uh, the, the categories we put them in actually refer to these four types of bonds. So all the things that dissolved and conducted electricity when they were dissolved are ionic bonds. All the things that dissolved but didn't conduct electricity were molecular covalent. Then there were the ones that didn't dissolve at all. So the ones that didn't dissolve at all and still conducted electricity were our metals. So that was metallic bonds. And then finally, we had things that didn't dissolve and then also didn't conduct so that was actually our covalent network bonds. So here's some practice. We want to identify whether each of the substances will conduct electricity. Now the way that we practiced this in class was to look at each of the individual atoms inside the compound and then to determine whether they were metals or nonmetals to predict whether it'll conduct electricity. Now, we start with carbon monoxide. Okay, carbon monoxide, we're going to look at each individual element and see whether it's a metal or nonmetal. So I go on my periodic table, and I see that carbon is actually on the right-hand side of my periodic table. So since it's on the right-hand side of the staircase, I know that this is a nonmetal. Oxygen is also on the right-hand side of the staircase, and so this is also a nonmetal. So since I have a compound that has a nonmetal with another nonmetal, I know that that creates or doesn't conduct electricity. It will not conduct electricity because it has no metals inside. Now, our next example, we have magnesium chloride. Again, we want to follow the same procedure. So, magnesium, if I look on the periodic table, is on the left hand side. And so, it is a metal. Magnesium is a metal. It's connected with chlorine. Chlorine is on the right-hand side of the staircase, and that's a nonmetal. So this is, you know, looking good for whether it'll conduct electricity because it in involves a metal now, right? But we also have to be careful about this section right here. We see that it's a solid. If you remember correctly, right, the metals to nonmetals were ionic compounds. They do not conduct electricity as a solid, right? They have to be dissolved in water for them to conduct electricity. So since this is a solid, even though it has a metal inside, we're going to say no, it does not conduct electricity. So let's move to our next one, sodium. Na, it's a solid. Again, we want to go to the periodic table, determine whether it's metals or nonmetals, and sodium happens to be all the way on the left-hand side as well, so this is a metal. There's nothing else it's combined with, and so it doesn't really matter that it's a solid because metals always conduct even as a solid, all right? So uh, this one, we would say yes, because it is a metal, a pure metal. Next one down, we have water. Now this is one of the ones we actually tested in our lab. So we'll, we'll do the same process, but I think we already know the results ahead of time. If I look at hydrogen, remember hydrogen was our exception to the rule. It's on the left-hand side, but it's still considered a non-metal. And then oxygen, if we look at that, it's, all, it's on the right-hand side, and so we know that's a non-metal as well. And since I have two non-metals that are connected, right, there's no way that this thing is going to conduct electricity, so this is also a no. All non-metals, so it can't conduct. So now we see uh, magnesium chloride again. All right, what's the deal with that? Well, we see something that's a little bit different this time, right? An AQ instead of it being a solid. So remember, this was magnesium was a metal, chlorine was a non-metal. So we have 
a metal with a nonmetal, metals in here. So we think maybe, oh, maybe this will conduct electricity. And we can confirm that by seeing that it's aqueous. Aqueous means that it's dissolved in water. And so this one will actually conduct electricity, unlike its friend up here, because this is a solid. So the solid will not, but the aqueous solution will. So this is just another kind of version of our flow chart, which shows us which type of atoms are present in each type of bond. And so for the first one, we have a metallic bond. Metallic bond involves all metal atoms. So if I have a metal connected with a metal or just a metal by itself, right, it's going to be a metallic bond. Now, if I have bonds that are entirely non-metal atoms, so this is a non-metal connected with another non-metal, then I know that's going to be some kind of covalent, whether it be covalent network or a molecular covalent. Either way, I know that it is at least a covalent type of bond. And so really, when we get down to it, when we're categorizing these things, we're either going to call it metallic, covalent, or ionic. We'll just kind of combine these two for our predictions. The last one uh, is a metal combined with a nonmetal. And so I have metal connected to a nonmetal, and these are our ionic compounds. And so when we classify again, we'll either have metallic, a covalent, or an ionic compound based upon just what is involved in the bonding. So here's some practice. This is the last thing we're going to do. We're going to practice determining which type of bond is present in each of the substances. So for the first one, we see that we have lead. Again, we're going to have to follow the same process we did before and go to the periodic table and look it up. So lead, PB, if I look it up on the periodic table, actually falls to the left of the staircase. And so since it's to the left of the staircase, we know it's a metal and it's not connected with anything but itself. So it's metals with metals. And we know that a metal connected to another metal produces a metallic bond. So let's move to the next one, carbon dioxide. Again, we want to identify whether we have metals or non-metals here. So we look up carbon. Carbon is again on the right-hand side, so that's a non-metal. Oxygen is also on the right-hand side of the staircase, so that's another non-metal. And anytime we have two non-metals that are connected, remember we're going to just combine and call them both covalent. Third one, potassium chloride. So we'll look up potassium, or K. K is actually all the way on the left-hand side. It's in the first column, and so that's a metal on the left-hand side of the staircase. Chlorine, we remember, is all the way on the right-hand side, so that's actually a non-metal. And so anytime I have a metal connected to a non-metal, we would call that an ionic compound. Lastly, we have oxygen. So this is kind of funny, right? Because it's O2. That just means there's two oxygens. So it happens to be, remember, oxygen's a nonmetal. A nonmetal connected with another nonmetal. And again, anytime it's two nonmetals, then we know it's covalent. So hopefully this was helpful as a, a review of the different things we've done before and also as a way to kind of practice identifying the different types of bonds there are as well as whether different bonded materials will conduct electricity.